Okay, so male reproductive system and then female reproductive system. We made it all the way to the end. Uh, it's hard to believe. I know uh, uh, it's gone extremely fast. So uh, most of you have been keeping up with the work. And, and I, again, I want to uh, remind you that you have a little over a week uh, left to uh, get everything turned in. And again, I'm still in the process of grading. Uh, more grades will be popping in there today and tomorrow. And so generally, yeah, over the next uh, 10 days, the grades will, as things come in, they'll get graded and you'll, uh, you'll uh, have a better idea of where you're at. And again, we're concluding unit nine. So you're going to want to uh, look at, and I'll pull it up today, actually, at, at the end, I'll pull up the uh, unit nine portfolio. So you can, you know, if there are any questions, you know, we can address those. And, um, but anyhow, yeah, we're, we're moving on uh, to the end here, home stretch. Uh, and uh, again, you, you have a couple of padlets to do for unit nine. Um, and then again, you want to uh, also do the two exams uh, in there and, uh, and then the final exam as well. So you have plenty to do uh, over the next uh, you know, ten, eight or 10 days or so. And again, if you need more time than uh, next Friday, if you need Saturday to do stuff, uh, Sunday, uh, you know, the 12th and 13th, again, please let me know. Uh, it shouldn't be a problem. I plan on turning in all of the final grades uh, by the end of the day, Sunday, December 13th. So try to get everything in at the very latest by then. Um, okay, so chapter 27.1 and 27.2 go through the male and female reproductive systems. So we'll take a peek at those. Uh, I think for the most part, um, you know, at this point in your lives, you probably have a pretty good idea of some of the basic structures of the reproductive system. Uh, next semester, we get into genetics and heredity a little bit. So uh, we'll circle back around to uh, kind of, you know, what happens once the sperm and the egg, or what we call them the gametes, once those come together, and uh, we start getting uh, a little zygote formed and, you know, and the development of the embryo and the fetus. We'll get into that next semester a little bit. So really today, I just want to go through the basics of the structures of uh, both male and female uh, systems. So um, we do need two parent organisms. We need a male and a female. We need uh, male gamete and female gamete. So we need a sperm and an egg uh, to combine. Um, we call it sexual reproduction. Okay, so it's sharing 23 chromosomes from the sperm cell, 23 chromosomes from the egg cell, combining to uh, be a 46 chromosome uh, being. Now, the type of reproduction that we've been talking about throughout the semester has involved mitosis and cell division. That's called asexual reproduction. So, uh, so anyway, cells reproduce as in the process of mitosis, which again, we'll get into a little bit more next semester. Uh, but asexual reproduction uh, leads to identical cells uh, of the parent cell. Um, so whereas sexual reproduction involves a, a, a couple extra steps, we call those meiosis or meiosis, some say. So, uh, but anyway, we'll get into meiosis more uh, next semester. So, um, so anyway, reproductive system. Um, we start with the male reproductive system. Uh, we have the essential organs uh, of both systems are going to be the gonads. So for the male reproductive system, the gonads are called testes. So those are the primary or essential organs. And then we have uh, a couple of accessories to go with uh, the testes. The testes we'll see produce the sperm cells, they produce testosterone, um, but primarily these sperm cells need to be delivered away from the testy uh, and out of the body. So the accessory organs are primarily going to be the ducts and that reproductive tract. So there'll be a tube that uh, travels from the gonad uh, 
out of the body. We'll look at a couple of glands. We're going to see three uh, specialized glands along the way that are going to uh, add to uh, the content of the semen. So the sperm cells actually come from the testes, but the, uh, the semen contains sperm cells as well as a bunch of other fructose and glucose and water and some other items. So those glands are going to be uh, what provide uh, the sperm cells uh, with a medium, in essence, to swim in. So and we call that semen. Uh, and then we'll have a few supporting structures. So again, the reproductive ducts are going to be uh, delivering the sperm cells from the testy uh, out of the body. So uh, when we look at the illustration, we'll see that uh, that reproductive tract or that uh, tube that's going to be delivering the sperm cells. So we'll start down at the testy uh, area. Okay, so we'll look at this more closely coming up in a few minutes. This is the site of sperm production. And as the sperm uh, cells are produced and they mature, they're going to end up in what we call the epididymis. So the epididymis is, uh, is a series of coiled tubing uh, where we generally see the maturation uh, process of this immature sperm cells take place. So as the sperm cells leave the testes, they're going to go into the epididymis, a okay, little cap on top of each testy. Okay, and then the sperm cells are going to travel into what we call the vas deferens. Okay, so that's this long tube, leaves the scrotum, travels here. You can see the spelling, vas deferens, also known as the ductus deferens. Okay, so sperm cells, tra and, and by the way, a vasectomy, uh, cutting the vas deferens, uh, occurs when uh, a male wants to, uh, I guess, become infertile. Okay? Not, uh, they don't become sterile per se. They're still producing sperm cells. They're just unable to, if we cut this line right here in this area, the sperm cells don't, uh, they can't leave the scrotum. So uh, enzymes will take care of them and destroy them, but... <clears throat> So anyway, a vasectomy is going to be cutting of the vas deferens. All right, so we travel, we continue the sperm cell uh, uh, heading toward uh, the exit. Okay? And as we uh, travel through the vas deferens, we're going to have our first uh, kind of gland or duct. We call it the seminal vesicle. <clears throat> so we'll look at the seminal vesicle in a little more detail in just a few minutes. Okay. That seminal vesicle will provide uh, the beginnings of, again, what's going to be uh, the semen, not just the sperm cells. So the sperm cells now are going to get uh, some, of the, uh, some of the nutrients that they need to continue their journey. Okay. As the sperm cells and, and now the semen continues forth, we're going to travel into the prostate gland or travel through the prostate gland. And at this point, we can see where the urethra that's cut, that we looked at on Tuesday, the urethra coming from the urinary bladder is going to meet up with uh, that, uh, um, what we call the ejaculatory duct. So as the vas deferens comes around, connects with the seminal vesicle, it's going to then become the ejaculatory duct. So no more vas deferens. Okay, so it's now called the uh, ejaculatory duct. And again, that's going to meet up with the urethra within the prostate gland. So um, anyhow, as we travel, uh, so now we have one connected tube. This would be considered the urethra at this point. Okay, so the urethra then leaves the prostate gland. And then we have another uh, little gland called the bulbourethral gland. They also call it the cowper gland, but bulbo urethral. Bulbo sounds like a like a bulb, so it's kind of a bulb shaped, a bulb shape. Okay. And urethra tells us kind of where that that bulbular gland is going to be connected to. So we have this little bulbo urethral gland. It's going to give a little spurt uh, that's going to add to the volume of the semen. 
Okay, and then we're going to just continue that flow uh, of the sperm cells in the semen. And then we're going to go out through the penis and uh, continue through the urethra. So we pass through what we call the urethral orifice. Okay, that's the hole that for males, it's the hole that urine uh, and semen pass through. Okay. So after uh, ejaculation occurs, uh, there's a little bit of a time period that has to take place to kind of get uh, the tubing uh, kind of reorganized a little bit. Uh, so then uh, to then allow urination to take place. Okay? So urination and ejaculation uh, cannot take place at the same time. Okay? So you can see uh, we've got one pathway open during sexual arousal, and then the rest of the time, this other pathway is open for urination. All right, so those are the main accessory uh, structures and features of the male reproductive system. Again, we start at the testes, uh, the primary uh, organs of the reproductive system, the gonad, okay? and then we travel through the epididymis and vas deferens, through the seminal vesicle and ejaculatory duct, meeting up with the urethra within the prostate gland, and then continuing on through the urethra, getting a little bit of extra spritz from the bulbal urethral gland, and then finally uh, continuing that journey through the urethra and out of the penis. Okay. So, uh, structure, location of test. So we'll go through a couple of these in a little more detail. We'll start with the testes. Uh, they're, uh, again, located within what we call the scrotum. And there's a, a little bit of uh, suspensory ligaments and scrotal tissue. There's little muscles uh, around the uh, vas deferens, sp the spermatic cords. Okay. We've got each testy encased in a tunic. So we've seen this word tunic before, or tunica. I think when we did the uh, cardiovascular system, we saw the blood vessels had different layers, right? The tunica intima and the intermediate okay, and the tunica externa, the three layers of a blood vessel. So again, a tunic is kind of like a, a, a robe or a cape, okay? Um, Albuginia has to do with alba means white. So it's kind of a white sheath that's going to cover or encase uh, each testy. So here's a kind of a look inside. We can see uh, what we call the reet testis. That's going to be kind of the, the, the last stop within the testy uh, before we start heading into these efferent ductules. And the efferent ducts are going to take us over to the epididymis. Okay, now throughout the testis, you're going to see what are called seminiferous tubules. So this is where uh, the sperm cells are going to be, uh, in essence, born. And, and uh, uh, they do a little bit of maturing uh, within each of these seminiferous tubules. And these are the seminiferous tubules are within what we call lobules, kind of like we saw with the kidneys. So these are little tiny lobes. And all these tubes are jam-packed uh, with new sperm cells. And uh, uh, these new spermatocytes or sperm cells are going to travel over to the reet testis through these efferent ductules and into the epididymis. We also can see the spermatic cord. It's not only the vas deferens, which we can still see, but we do see blood supply there as well. We see uh, red and blue, of course, meaning that we have a little artery and a little vein. Okay. So that all may, and there's some muscle as well uh, that's involved uh, with uh, that seminiferous tubule and that spermatic cord. Okay. So seminiferous tubules continue and ultimately become uh, the vas deferens. Okay. And then combined, we have again what we call the spermatic cord. Now, when we go a little deeper and look at the testes, we do see some cells. We see the specialized cells. Uh, the first batch are called interstitial cells uh, or Leydig cells. These are gonna be the endocrine cells. 
Okay, so these are going to be between the seminiferous tubules. So you're going to find Leydig cells kind of scattered between and around the seminiferous tubules. This is again where we're going to find the endocrine aspects. And for the testes, that's going to be testosterone. Okay, the site of production of testosterone is performed within the testes, specifically by these interstitial Leydig cells. Okay. Uh, let's see. So this gives us, here's the, the tunic or the covering uh, of each testy. So out, this, is, this would be the uh, outside, would be within the scrotum still uh, where the red dot is, but then this is going to be kind of that outer covering of the testy. Okay, and then we have uh, a bunch of seminiferous tubules. Okay, so in between the tubules, you can see some space there. Okay, so in between the tubules, there's space. That's where the Leydig cells are interstitial. Remember, inter means between. Okay, so the interstitial cells, that's where testosterone is going to be produced. Okay, and then within the seminiferous tubules, you can see some really dark uh, kind of spots down here, and those are going to be the nuclei of the sperm cells. So all of these are spermatogenic cells. So they're going to be they're going to develop into being mature spermatocytes that are then ultimately going to leave this seminiferous tubule and head out toward the epididymis. Okay. So then we have what are called sustentacular cells. Okay, sustentacular cells. These are going to help regulate the sperm production. Okay, so now we're kind of getting away from the Leydig or interstitial cells that monitor and regulate testosterone and now going into the other function of the testes and that's going to be the actual production of sperm. So sustentaculars secrete something called inhibin. It's going to inhibit gonadotropin releasing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. These, remember, uh, GNRH goes all the way up. It's a releasing hormone. So it's going to be part of the hypothalamus. And then this follicle stimulating, so we see the stimulating, that's going to be part of the pituitary gland. So pri primarily the anterior pituitary. So we do see the gonadotropin releasing hormone coming from the hypothalamus, triggering follicle stimulating hormone uh, to then head down as a target to the testes and trigger the release uh, of spermatocytes. Well, inhibin is going to uh, be produced by these sustentacular cells and it's going to go up and its target is going to be the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary to basically shut off uh, to say we have enough sperm cells right now let's go ahead and put the brakes and pause the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone okay. so if inhibin isn't there you're going to have hyper production of sperm cells we also see these sustentacular cells produce uh, a, an androgen binding protein. Androgen just relates to uh, something with males and, and uh, uh, androgen, uh, again, yeah, kind of like uh, uh, male proteins, okay? androgen, okay? which bind to testosterone and make it more soluble. Okay, so these also are going to help out uh, with the Leydig and interstitial cells uh, with the testosterone that comes from those. Okay, so we get uh, similar uh, to what we see here. This next slide actually kind of blows this area up a little bit so we can look a little more closely at what's going on. So again, we can see these interstitial cells in between the seminiferous tubules. <clears throat> okay, and then at the basement of these, uh, of these uh, uh, seminiferous cells, we can see uh, within that the sustentacular cells as well as the spermatogenic cells. Okay, so, this, so basically the three types of cells that you're going to see within the testes are going to be uh, exclusively, one is going to be exclusively related to testosterone. 
Okay, those are the interstitial cells. And then the sustentaculars do a little bit with testosterone. They do a little, they help with, with making it uh, with solubility. They also uh, help with uh, kind of inhibiting uh, the, the release of the chemicals or the hormones from the hypothalamus and pituitary that trigger the release or the, the growth of sperm cells. So these guys are kind of put on the brakes of sperm cell production. So, uh, so anyway, sustentacular, kind of, uh, a, remember two roles of the, of the testes, testosterone production and sperm cell production. So interstitials do the testosterone part, spermatogenics do the sperm cell parts, and then the sustentacular do a little bit for each. The, on the sperm cell side, sustentaculars bring uh, the sperm count down, and then the, uh, the uh, sustentacular cells related to the testosterone part are going to be producing a protein that's going to help with solubility of the testosterone produced by interstitial cells. So anyhow, kind of a lot of action, a lot more action probably than you thought going on. The, the presence of these sustentacular cells, again, if they are in, uh, if they outnumber or an extreme amount relative to the spermatogenic cells, that could decrease your uh, sperm count. So too many sustentacular cells will produce too much inhibin, which then produce, which then leads to inhibiting gonadotropin releasing hormone, thus limiting uh, follicle stimulating hormone, thus limiting uh, the hormone that's going to come down and tell the spermatogenic cells that they need to start reproducing or continue the reproduction. So if we have too much sustentacular cell, too much inhibin, then we're going to have a decrease in sperm count. If we don't have enough sustentacular cells, we're going to have an excess of sperm cell production. Okay, that's usually not the case. Uh, usually if we have an issue with these sustentacular cells, it's going to be that they're uh, not working, uh, uh, that they're overworking, not underworking. So if they're overworking, that means we have too much inhibin, which means we're going to inhibit sperm cell production, thus lowering sperm count. All right, so anyway, spermatogenic cells, these are the cells that ultimately become uh, what are called spermatids, and these little spermatids will eventually uh, head into the lumen of the seminiferous tubule and become spermatocytes or mature sperm cells. Okay, so again, the testes functions are spermatogenesis. We're going to see the, the creation or the genesis of sperm cells. And then, uh, so these are what we call gametes. Okay, a gamete is a sperm cell, and we all, we call it a spermatozoan as well. The spermatozoa is the plural form. Okay, and then of course the second function of the testes is testosterone production, and, and again, it's the major uh, male sex hormone in humans, testosterone. steroid hormone uh, as well. Now, we, we didn't really classify uh, hormones that terribly much uh, this semester. We will next semester, but uh, uh, steroid hormones are fat or lipid-based, and they're out of the multitude, 40, 50, 60 plus hormones in the body. There are only about five of them that are steroidal hormones. Most of them are non-steroidal uh, and therefore more uh, protein or amino acid based. So, um, so anyway, the sex hormones. So if the first one, testosterone, then we'll see estrogen with females, progesterone with females. Those are going to be steroid uh, hormones, growth hormone as well. Okay. So anyway, why do you need testosterone? Well, uh, it helps with maintaining your secondary sex characteristics. So um, uh, the deep voice, the, the body hair, uh, primarily some of the major sex characteristics of males, secondary sex characteristics. Okay. Behavior, testosterone can uh, dictate uh, some of uh, our behavior as well. Okay. 
uh, metabolism. It also helps with stimulating uh, protein anabolism, which is protein synthesis, right? Building up protein. So it helps with cell metabolism. We certainly are going to see some of our bone growth and uh, kind of the, the closing of the epiphyseal lines. So uh, a lot of testosterone uh, being pumped out during pubescent years, uh, again, to stimulate bone growth. And then we do see testosterone also aiding in some of our fluid and electrolyte balance. Now, as we continue uh, with some of our uh, hormone uh, talk. Again, we've seen FSH. We just saw it a few minutes ago. That's that follicle stimulating hormone. So that's from the anterior pituitary and it's going to come down uh, and again, stimulate sperm production. So, uh, and, and again, the, uh, the hypothalamus releases gonadotropin releasing hormone to elicit the release of follicle stimulating hormone. And we looked at inhibin a few minutes ago, that's gonna prevent uh, FSH and GNRH, well, GNRH and then FSH from being released. The other primary uh, hormone from the anterior pituitary that we see involved is what we call luteinizing hormone. So again, two, two main functions of, of the testes uh, sperm production, testosterone production. So the sperm production part comes from the FSH of the anterior pituitary, the interstitial cells producing testosterone, that's going to be triggered by luteinizing hormone or LH. Again, both of these coming from the anterior pituitary. High concentration of glucose will inhibit uh, the secretion of gonadotropin uh, releasing hormone. Okay, so if we have too much uh, testosterone, it can actually inhibit the release of uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone, thus inhibiting the release of follicle stimulating hormone coming all the way back up then, thus uh, inhibiting then uh, sperm cell production. So um, a lot of bodybuilders, a lot of weightlifters, uh, a lot of athletes uh, use uh, testosterone, synthetic testosterone, PEDs, uh, steroids. Uh, well, these can certainly increase uh, testosterone levels um, and that can uh, render them impotent uh, or sterile, I should say, and impotent possibly. But yeah, it can get to the point where all that excessively high uh, concentration of testosterone will shut down uh, then sperm cell production. So anyway, um, estrogen, um, males do have tiny amounts of estrogen. Uh, in males, it's primarily going to be made in the liver. Okay. So let's look, uh, just take a, we're just about done with the male reproductive. There's a few things on the, on the micro scale I want to go through regarding uh, uh, spermatogenesis and how a sperm cell uh, is um, in essence, how it matures. So uh, a spermatozoan, uh, this is plural. If I put an N on the end, it's a singular spermatozoa uh, are sperm cells. And again, they need to undergo kind of a maturation or ripening process before ejaculation. And this typically uh, is going to occur um, uh, within starting within that epididymis and then kind of continuing throughout uh, the reproductive tract. Uh, there's another term called uh, capacitation, cap, right? Something to do with the, the cap or the head of the sperm cell, which is where the DNA uh, is located. Uh, that occurs uh, capacitation of a sperm cell after uh, the sperm cell has been introduced to the vagina. So uh, before, uh, so the whole time it's in the male reproductive tract, uh, capacitation is not occurring. Once we uh, ejaculate and get into the vagina, the sperm cells start to uh, undergo capacitation. So that head uh, is altered. We're going to see uh, then the ability for these guys to, to kind of make their way and migrate to the egg, which we'll find in the fallopian tube. Okay. So a spermatozoan, again, is going to be a head, a middle piece, and a tail. And the head is going to be covered by what we call an acrosome, which is going to have uh, the ability to, uh, that has 
the, the ability to release enzymes that are going to split and kind of break down uh, that outer shell of the egg. So uh, the head of this, which is that capacitation part. So basically it's altering the head uh, of the sperm cell. So it's then able to release enzymes that are going to break apart uh, the outer shell uh, of the uh, ovum or the egg. Okay. And then there's going to be a middle piece. The middle piece of the sperm cell, kind of the neck of the sperm cell, that's where we're going to see a whole bunch of mitochondria. And remember, mitochondria relate to ATP or cellular energy. So this is kind of the gas tank of the sperm cell. So the head is where the DNA is stored. Uh, the middle piece is where the, the gas tank is. And then the tail is going to be uh, the... Uh, the flagellum or tail of the sperm cell is what provides uh, locomotion or the ability of the sperm cell to move. So uh, this middle piece is kind of fueling up the uh, tail with ATP so the tail can function uh, and uh, uh, allow the sperm cell to move or to have mobility. Okay, so again, we look at, uh, we look at this little kind of hat or cone on the head uh, of the sperm cell. And then the nucleus is where we're going to find the DNA, the genetic code. And then we have a couple little centrioles uh, and then the mitochondria within that middle piece that again are going to be responsible for the ATP and supplying the gas to allow that tail uh, to wiggle and, and uh, propel the sperm cell uh, up toward uh, the egg. All right, so let's kind of work backwards a little bit. Boop, 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 boop. Go all the way over here to A. So none of this should be, uh, again, that terribly uh, new to us. We see, again, these all these seminiferous tubules, little uh, septa or walls between the, the uh, these uh, columns here. And then uh, what we end up with, again, is dumping everything kind of into that reet testis area and the, the uh, efferent ductules into the epididymis. So this is, should look familiar. <laughs> so when we uh, take out the seminiferous tubule, now we're going to do a cross section of it. We're going to see exactly what is going on inside of that seminiferous tubule. So the first thing we see uh, is a, are a bunch of spermatic gonia. So kind of in the, the basement is going to be where <clears throat> you can see it says basement membrane. So kind of at the basement is where we're going to see uh, the most immature, the newest members, the, the, the newborns. This is kind of like the nursery, just like we saw with uh, the epidermis of the skin. We saw that the deepest layer of the epidermis is where we're going to find uh, the um, a lot of your uh, newborn, kind of the nursery, right? A lot of your mitosis and uh, that is going to be going on in the deeper uh, layers. And then as we move our way up, we see uh, start to see what are called uh, spermatocytes. And there's some sustentacular cells kind of nestled in, the, in here. You can't really see them. But uh, in between all this negative space is where uh, we're going to see some sustentacular cells. Yeah. So anyway, the, spermat the spermatogonia becomes spermatocytes. And then uh, we see what are called little spermatid or spermatids. Okay, and then these little uh, spermatids and ultimately then become mature sperm cells. Okay, so we go from spermatogonia to spermatocytes to spermatids to sperm cells. Okay, and then we blow those up and take a peek. We see the head, the midpiece, and the tail of the sperm cell. And then again, looking at the, the uh, acrosome and all, all those mitochondria that are fueling the tail. Okay. So just about done, just a couple more items here. The epididymis, again, that's kind of the, the, the uh, finishing school or the, uh, the matur, you know, it's, yeah, it's where the, 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 uh, the sperm cells go to start maturing a little bit more. Um, and then uh, there's a little bit of seminal fluid uh, secreted at this point. So, <clears throat> Really, uh, there's not a heck of a lot going on yet with, uh, with uh, 
uh, seminal fluid. So what we have are the sperm cells. And then when we enter into the epididymis, we get a, a little duct here in the epididymis that's going to be adding a little bit of seminal fluid. Okay, very little. Okay, and then we travel uh, into the vas deferens that extends from the epididymis, travels uh, through the into the abdominal cavity uh, over the uh, bladder, and then kind of terminates at that seminal vesicle forming the ejaculatory duct. So we'll look, take a peek at that in a little more detail. We looked at it earlier, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll look at it again here in just a few minutes. Okay, why do you have a vas deferens? Again, it's, it's simply another part of the, the duct or the, re, the reproductive tract. Okay, it's one of the main tubes or tracts, uh, main tubes or sections of uh, the tract. Okay, and then we uh, make our way from that uh, vas deferens and we head into uh, the seminal vesicle and then the ejaculatory duct within the prostate gland and that meets up again with the urethra. Yeah. Let me see. Oh man, my hold on a second. I'm gonna bring this one slide back down, make a copy of it so I don't have to go all the way back. Copy. <laughs> Yep, almost done with male reproductive tract, but I did want to, um, there we go. All right, so back to the main uh, illustration. So again, we left the epididymis into the vas deferens, come up to the seminal vesicle. Okay, and then uh, we're going to get more seminal fluid at this point, uh, and then that's going to dump into the ejaculatory duct and again connect with the urethra within the prostate gland. Okay, and then we continue out, uh, the, out of the prostate gland within that urethra, and then again seeing that bulbo urethral gland uh, add a little bit of, of extra uh, to the seminal fluid before we're ready to exit. Okay, so let me, there we go. So uh, seminal vesicles. So what's going on at that seminal vesicle? Again, this is where we're going to get kind of an alkaline fluid. Alkaline's good. That's basic, right? We don't want acidic at this point. Acidity will kill sperm cells. So uh, we have an alkaline, uh, kind of a, a creamy yellow liquid, which makes up about 60% of the semen volume coming from that seminal vesicle. Okay, and fructose is the primary energy source that the sperm cells get uh, to be able to continue. Again, you know, those mitochondria in the mid piece uh, are producing, or not producing, they're, they're um, synthesizing uh, energy. And so anyway, they need glucose or fructose, they need some sugar. So uh, the, the primary um, component of seminal fluid besides sperm cells is going to be some sort of sugar or food for the sperm cells to consume to make that long journey uh, that they're, they're uh, going on. Okay, and then the prostate gland again uh, is going to uh, secrete um, more seminal fluid. Uh, it's going to be slightly acidic but uh, it's basically going to bring everything to being alkaline or even basic. We already have alkalinity. 60% of the seminal fluid is alkaline. 30% of the seminal fluid is slightly acidic. So we're still going to maintain some alkalinity and, and uh, close to being neutral. Okay, so if the prostate is out of control and the um, seminiferous tubule uh, is not functioning very well, we get kind of a switch where we've got 60% of the fluid coming from the prostate, that's going to alter the pH uh, of the seminal fluid and therefore alter uh, the uh, function of the sperm cells. It's going to render them dysfunctional. So again, another possibility of why uh, a male may have uh, fertility problems. 
Okay. So one is going to be hormonal. We might have some gonadotropin, some in, too much inhibin being released okay, by those sustentacular cells that would inhibit uh, the production of sperm cells. Maybe that's working fine, but we get into, uh, we get into the uh, seminal vesicle uh, and for whatever reason, um, it's not producing enough uh, seminal fluid. And uh, so the prostate, so there's not enough uh, basicity or alkalinity. And so the prostate glands working at normal pace, or maybe it's over uh, producing uh, uh, its fluids. So we end up with more of an acidic uh, uh, seminal fluid, and that could lead to certainly uh, issues with uh, productivity uh, and the, the function of sperm cells. Okay, so, uh, so anyway, prostate releases kind of a watery, milky looking secretion uh, that adds about 30% uh, to the seminal volume. So, uh, so between the seminal vesicle and the prostate gland, uh, about 90% of the, the seminal fluid uh, is going to be coming from these two. And again, we get a little tiny bit from the epididymis, a little bit from the bulbal urethral. Oh, and what's in that fluid is something called citrate, a, another nutrient for the sperm cells. Okay, and then lastly is that bulbourethral gland. Okay, so seminal vesicle, prostate gland, bulbourethral gland, tiny little P-shaped structure. Uh, and its primary job is to secrete a little bit of alkalinity that's counteracting uh, some of that acid uh, that came from the prostate gland as well as is potentially gonna be found within the female uh, vagina. So um, if the, again, pH balance is what the name of the game is for, for homeostasis, for, for reproduction, perpetuating life, and we're seeing more and more uh, men with low sperm counts or inability to you know, keep sperm cells alive as soon as uh, they enter into the, uh, the vaginal canal, uh, they, they get destroyed by the acidity. Um, so it could be seminal vesicle, bulbal urethral issues um, that are leading to the fertility problems. Okay. And again, as we move into the female reproductive system, we can have all systems are normal with the male reproductive system. Uh, as soon as the, the seminal fluid and the sperm cells enter into the vaginal canal, the, the female reproductive tract may be hyperacidic. So uh, maybe uh, something going on with the pH on that end. So that's basically what fertility specialists are trying to determine is where along the path of uh, sperm cell in the testy all the way out into the vaginal canal uh, of the female and then the ovary coming into the fallopian tube and the sperm cells trying to make it up. I mean, where along the process is there a problem? And if it's, you know, so it's very tricky. And oftentimes it has to do with hormones. It has certainly has to do with pH levels. We could have both uh, parents having issues with pH balance, then less, thus leading to more uh, fertility uh, uh, specialists and more um, help with fertilization. So anyway, yeah, a lot of, you know, a lot of, a lot of action. And we, we know that these fertility specialists are busy. We're seeing an, a, a vast increase in uh, uh, in the the use uh, and need uh, the demand for uh, fertility specialists. So um, I don't know what that says. I think one thing it definitely says is that um, our our hormones and our uh, which are um, produced by what we provide our bodies with. So if you have hormone issues there may be something wrong with consumption. There may be a lack or an excess of, of certain things that are harmful to the body, um, all the way to the hormone level. We know alcohol plays a huge role in altering pH. Alcohol makes things uh, a little bit uh, 
rough in the body. We'll put it that way. It dehydrates the body. Uh, alcohol on its uh, on its own is um, is is basic. It's uh, the OH group of the alcohol is going to lend to more uh, alkalinity. But the how the body responds to alcohol is that it creates a more acidic environment within the body. It creates uh, uh, high levels of dehydration. And we know that alters uh, certainly the pH of the reproductive tract and thus can lead to fertility issues. So, um, man, uh, so many things that we consume in our youth that maybe we don't think about uh, affecting us when we're older and maybe ready to, to have children. And then, uh, so it's very important to teach our children and to teach the, the youth that uh, taking care of the body, staying hydrated, uh, avoiding extremes in, in alcohol, avoiding ex extremes in other uh, types of, of bad uh, foods okay, and beverages, caffeines, sugars, okay, uh, proteins. We have to balance all of this stuff out. Okay, and what that's going to do is enable us to, uh, you know, to reproduce. So if we don't take care of those, you know, so if we teach our young that the importance of all these basics, then as they get older and they're ready to start families and, and reproducing, they're not going to have these fertility issues. So, um, so anyway, yeah, take care of your, your, your eggs, take care of your sperm cells and uh, take care of your body as a whole. Otherwise, you'll you'll deal. You may have some fertility problems uh, in, uh, down the road. Okay, so that's pretty much it. We've got the scrotum and the the penis, of course. The scrotum is uh, has uh, is divided into left and right sections. There's a little septum there, um, and there's some fascia and some some musculature that kind of keeps everything. Uh, uh, together. There's a muscle called the cremaster muscle that, again, forms kind of a pouch uh, for each of the testes. Okay, and the, and this uh, penis, we're going to see three cylindrical masses of tissue. Okay, and we're going to see two large masses called the corpora cavernosa, and then we're going to see one smaller mass called the corpus spongiosum. So this corpus spongiosum is where the urethra is going to pass through. So here's a cross section of the penis. We can see uh, the dorsal uh, blood vessels of the penis and then we can see the corpora cavernosa and the corpus spongiosum. And again that's where the urethra uh, is going to pass through. So this is the top or the, the dorsal uh, surface. This is the ventral uh, surface. Okay. Spermatic cords, we've already looked at. Oh, so, uh, so seminal fluid. So again, you, you know, as we leave the testes into the epididymis, we're going to see uh, a little bit of seminal fluid, and then we go through the seminal vesicle. We get about 60% of the fluid. Prostate adds another 30%. Bubble urethral a little bit uh, of a spritz, and now all of a sudden we've got uh, the whole uh, volume of seminal fluid. And again, uh, primarily going to be citrate and fructose. Okay, there's going to be some chemistry to help with pH balance as well. Yep. Okay. Male fertility, again, we're dealing with numbers of sperm. Okay. What are the numbers? And, and if the number is really low, uh, in the in the testes or in even in the ejaculate, we can potentially conclude that there's too much inhibin. There's so we need to maybe uh, promote gonadotropin releasing hormone and inhibit inhibin. Inhibit inhibin. Right? We need to stop what's inhibiting uh, our hypothalamic and pituitary connection from re releasing their hormones again to get sperm cell production going. So a uh, number of sperm is important because that can tell us maybe, maybe where the problem is. Uh, and then maybe we have enough sperm, but the, the size of the sperm, um, they're, they're kind of shrivelly, the, the shape, they might, some of them might have double tails uh, on them. Some of them, again, may have uh, me lacking that acrosome or that 
that little cap. And, and then motility has to do with how well they swim. Are they good swimmers? Do they have enough? Um, that middle section, that mid piece where the mitochondria are, is there enough ATP being you know, generated from that motor uh, to, to allow the sperm to be mobile or, or, or motile? So again, you know, we could have number, sperm count number looks great, size and shape look great, but they're not moving around. They're just kind of sluggish with their tails as a group. That could tell us, yeah, again, we've got some uh, uh, glucose, fructose, ATP recipe problems. And again, some of that stuff's coming from the seminiferous tubule or the uh, seminal vesicle uh, or the prostate gland. So maybe we're lacking something there. So anyway, antibodies, some men produce antibodies that attack their own sperm. It's almost like an autoimmune uh, issue. So uh, testosterone uh, in red, sperm cell production in blue. So when we are in the womb, yeah, the first uh, trimester, so it's the boy, okay, obviously, first trimester, not a lot of testosterone, but the second trimester where we see amazing amount of organ development in the, in the fetus, this is where we're going to see um, the need for more growth hormone, bone elongation, okay? uh, protein synthesis. So testosterone is huge for the, for the baby, okay? the, the fetal baby. And then by the time they get into the third trimester, things start to slow down a little bit because uh, again, we, we want to, um, we still want to see them growing, but we, we can kind of slow some of the process down as far as the metabolic uh, aspects of, of the, the uh, bony growth. Okay, and then baby's born and we get uh, uh, the newborn baby boy uh, is going to be releasing a whole bunch of testosterone, uh, really uh, the first couple months and kind of peaking out at six months. And then it kind of slows back down at a year of, of age. So from about a year old until puberty, boys aren't really producing a hell heck of a lot of uh, testosterone. Okay. Again, that first year, man, they're growing like crazy. They're, it's, it's wild. Okay? If you've ever been around a new baby, you know growth hormone is, is big. Okay? First year, they grow a lot. And then, yeah, we kind of level it off. And then at puberty, you know, 13 or so, uh, we start to see testosterone levels increase. That is subsequently going to lead now to sperm cell production. So uh, by the time we're right around 18, 20 years old, we're hitting that peak of, of sexual uh, aspects. And so again, we see that testosterone and sperm cell. And then, you know, we get a, a closer to our 70s, uh, you know, testosterone, old age, you know, everything starts to decrease a little bit. And that includes sperm cell production. So by the time we're in our mid 70s, we really start to see sperm production and testosterone production uh, really on a decline. Okay. So yeah, a lot of years, so men are, are fertile, uh, potentially from, you know, 12, 13 years old, all the way till they're dead. So yeah. And then lastly, for the males, we see the descent in the womb. Uh, we see the testy uh, or the testis coming down. Okay. We have this, what's called a gubernaculum which is, is basically going to help with this va invagination that's going to occur, uh, basically creating kind of a tube uh, for that testy to continue to descend down through. And we've got uh, uh, the, uh, again, kind of that invagination uh, area here. We don't see it there. The testy is getting pulled down, gubernaculum. And again, we see this start to shorten. And then we see a little groove start to develop right in here. Okay, so you can kind of see how this connects and it just kind of pulls and pulls and pulls and create, as this muscle is pulling, it's creating uh, an, an, an invagination or like a groove, basically kind of a, a tunnel. Okay, so that's what this is. 
Okay, and then the gubernaculum continues. We continue to get that, uh, that musculature stretch. Notice too, it's attached to the pubic bone. The pubic bone's developing. So as the pubic bone develops, gets a little bigger. Okay, we can see everything kind of get pulled. And then this becomes the epididymis. This invagination kind of connects, becomes the epididymis. And then we could see, oh, there's the epididymis right there. Okay. And you can see the vas deferens. So this will all kind of close up and become part of the wall of the testy. So if the testy doesn't descend, uh, it could be, again, we've got a kink somewhere in the line over here. So they sometimes the doctor will say, just wait and, and it'll, it'll descend. It'll take care of itself for that first year. And if not, they may have to do a procedure to kind of pull it down and get this uh, invagination going on its own, uh, you know, with the help of, the, of them. Okay. If the testy is kind of up here, they call it, it's in a crypt. It's, it's hidden. Cryptorchidism, they call it. All right. So anyway, that's the male reproductive system. Uh, we'll look at the uh, female reproductive system, uh, kind of the same process, go through the, the basics of uh, the primary sex organ, which would be uh, the ovary, right? And then they kind of move on into the secondary uh, aspects of the tube. So there are a few extra functions of the female reproductive system that we don't see with the male reproductive system. Certainly, the similarities are we get the, the other gamete, right? We need, we need 23 more chromosomes. The sperm cells only carrying 23, so we need that egg uh, to give us the other 23. All right, so, um, so those first two kind of make sense. The last one is different for females than males, and that certainly has to do with providing a nice uh, home uh, and some nutrients for that developing uh, embryo and fetus. So the baby needs a place to live. So the female reproductive system has a room ready called the uterus. So we'll look at that as well. Okay, again, just like we see with the male reproductive system, we see for the female, the essential uh, reproductive organs are the gonads, and this time they're called ovaries and not testes. Okay, so ovaries, just like testes, are going to be producing hormone as well as the gamete or the egg. So um, this, again, not a lot of difference, right? The testy is producing testosterone and sperm cells. Eggs are producing estrogen, progesterone, and egg cells. So basically, you know, it's very similar. <laughs> so keep that in mind because we've got the same chemicals, FSH and LH, coming from uh, the anterior pituitary. Okay, so we're going to have uh, the uh, ovaries, and then we'll have some fallopian tubes or uterine tubes heading to the uterus, and then the, va the vagina or the vaginal canal, and then the external uh, aspects, the external genitals, we call the vulva. So we'll look at, at uh, all of this as well. The, we have some additional reproductive structures, additional structures for the reproductive system, uh, the the mammary glands or the breasts. So we'll look at those briefly as well. When we look at a kind of a mid uh, uh, sagittal view of uh, the female reproductive system, we'll start just like we did with the males, we'll start at the, uh, the uh, uh, gonad and work our way uh, out of the body. So we have the ovary kind of perched up here okay, within the abdominal cavity, the abdominal uh, region. Okay, and then we have uh, what's called the uterine tube. You guys know it as the fallopian tube as well. So that's where they, it's got little fingers coming off of it, kind of massage the egg. And then as the egg uh, is released into the fallopian tube, it's going to travel down and work its way into the uterus. Okay, and then uh, in this fallopian tube is where the sperm cells are trying to, that's their destination. They're trying to make it all the way from inside that testy out through the epididymis, vas deferens, seminal uh, vesicle into that 
prostate gland, vulval urethral gland, the urethra out uh, into the vaginal canal, traveling going past the cervix into the uterus, and then finally making its way to the fallopian tube. That's a long way to travel. It's amazing any of us make it, right? It's amazing any of us are here. Uh, the beauty of, of, uh, of uh, reproduction, right? It's a, an amazing, amazing thing. So anyhow, uh, so a lot has to happen. Okay, for the, that's why the sperm cell, that's why the, the seminal fluid, uh, you know, that, I mean, sperm cells make up maybe like a, less than a percent of the whole batch of seminal fluid. Uh, most of the seminal fluid is food to feed the sperm cells because they've got a long way to, to go. All right. So anyway, as we leave the, so um, fertilization occurs in the fallopian tube, and then that little fertilized bugger uh, is going to travel down into the wall of the uterus and, and plant itself and live there for about nine months or so. And then uh, once they're ready to, to leave, they have to exit through the cervix into the vaginal canal and then out. Now, if the sperm cells don't make it to the fallopian tube, which is most of the time, right? I mean, uh, most folks have maybe one, two, three, four kids, you know, but uh, there's a lot of time, a lot of years to potentially carry children. So, um, so anyway, uh, sperm cells don't always make it. And of course we use a variety of different um, uh, birth control or prophylactic uh, techniques that will, uh, you know, inhibit the sperm cell from making it all the way to the fallopian tube. So anyway, uh, if it doesn't, then the egg will die and come down into the uh, uh, uterus. And in the meantime, we've got a uterine lining or an endometrium that's been developed. Uh, basically, what would have been, you know, the placenta and the kind of the, you know, the amniotic sac and all of, you know, the goodies that were going to help kind of feed and house the the, the fertilized egg, they're not necessary because the egg didn't get fertilized. So that's what we call menstruation. So uh, shedding that lining, shedding that egg, we're going to move that through uh, the cervical opening and then out. So, so anyway, that's what's going on uh, with the, uh, the structural basics. So we go from ovary to fallopian tube into the uterus, uh, past the cervix, and then out through the vaginal canal. Okay, the other thing I was watching to notice, and I'll show you again here in a few minutes, but notice there's a lot of little like uh, kind of ligaments that are kind of, you know, holding everything up. Okay? A lot of support ligaments and structures. Okay. A couple other items we saw the urinary uh, system and urinary bladder uh, and that urethra. So the urethra is anterior okay? and then the vaginal canal and then uh, the uh, rectal uh, area and the colon. Okay, so there's three main body systems all in one spot, or not one spot, but a very close spot. We've got uh, digestive, reproductive, and urinary all located in, in a very close proximity. So again, hygiene is extremely important. Uh, um, you know, on all levels. Consumption is important too, because uh, again, you know, if we've got bad consumption here uh, in the mouth, it's going to affect our digestive tract. It's also going to affect our urinary tract. And those uh, could have uh, detrimental effects on the reproductive system. So, uh, and, and again, sexual health, also important, not just hygiene, but uh, making sure that, uh, you know, you're practicing safe sex and uh, hygienic sex and all of that good stuff. So uh, you don't want uh, to be mixing too many things up and uh, getting bacterias and uh, inflammations and pelvic inflammatory diseases and, you know, uh, lots of other issues. I mean, they even discuss, uh, you know, a, a lot of just going to the birth control aspects. You know, there's there's the, they talk about a diaphragm that kind of covers up and some of the spermaticides, like some of the, the lubrication fluids that, you know, they have special chemicals that kill sperm cells and, you know, 
uh, certainly condoms and some of the spermaticides there and lubrication fluids, uh, birth control uh, pills and patches and um, Depo-Provera shots and uh, IUDs, intrauterine devices where they, you know, basically put uh, something in this area here, like a little uh, kind of a plastic deal with some springs and kind of a butterfly uh, shape. And it, it kind of basically closes everything off. We can put it all the way in the, the uterus and kind of cap that off. They even have uh, uh, devices for birth control where they actually inject uh, uh, a little uh, kind of a metallic spiral uh, with little spikes, like a coiled spiky spiral into the fallopian tube that will again prevent the egg and the sperm from coming together. Now, uh, sounds like a lot of, of stuff going in there, doesn't it? Other than just a penis? Man, that's a lot of, or you know, whatever else. But anyway, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of product. So, you know, again, in our youth, ages 13 or 14, till we're in our tw mid 20s or something, you know, we want, we don't want babies, but you know, we want to you know, we want to experience life a little bit and uh, without a child. And so, yeah, birth control and, uh, but yeah, long-term birth control can, can certainly have effects. Now, when you get into your late twenties, early thirties, you decide you want to start having a family. That's when things can sometimes pop up that uh, lead to infertility issues again, from previous, uh, you know, whatever's right. Whether it's birth control, uh, um, pills or patches, whether it's uh, actual physical devices that are being inserted into these areas. Okay. Um, so anyway, that's the fertility aspects and some of the dangers that can come from, you know, practicing, uh, uh, you know, I guess, hormone replacement and, you know, because a lot of these IUDs, they have copper in them and that affects uh, some of the pH and the chemistry. So um, so anyway, that's potentially wreaking havoc on some uh, females' uh, reproductive systems. It helps them today not have babies, but when they want to have babies in the future, uh, they run into some issues. So, uh, and again, it's not everybody, but we are seeing quite an increase in uh, infertility. Uh, so let's see. Oh, and then, you know, so egg, that's for fertilizing. Uh, if the egg doesn't get fertilized, like we said, you're going to shed the lining and uh, have a period or a menstrual uh, flow. And so uh, some women will uh, prevent, uh, not prevent, you can't really prevent the flow, but uh, they will uh, gather the menstrual uh flow the blood through the use of a tampon or something along those lines. Some women are using uh, what we call um, a cervical cup uh, uh, where you kind of insert like a little uh, kind of a, uh, some sort of almost like a rubbery, um, it's made of plant matter. Uh, so it's they generally these cervical cups are organic material. Uh, they, some, some of them look like little diaphragms as well, uh, little cups. Some of them look like actual kind of tapered little shot glasses. Uh, but they, yeah, they put those up there. Uh, it's called a menstrual cup, not a cervical cup, a menstrual cup. Uh, there's uh, one's called a diva cup that's uh, like 20, 30 bucks and you can use it, you know, it's not a one-time use. And then uh, there are others that are more disposable. Um, I can't think of what those are called. But anyway, there are, there are other options for uh, collecting your menstrual blood than uh, putting a tampon in uh, or wearing uh, some sort of uh, uh, pad, like a maxi pad or, you know, panty liner certainly will get some of that. But Hey, so anyway, there are options for menstrual uh, cycle, blood, dealing with the blood. <laughs> so anyway, Diva Cup. Yeah, that's and then and then um, I, and again I can't think of what the disposable ones are. But anyway, um, my wife, my wife, she's she's we've been married seventeen years, so she's she's had a few periods certainly along the way. And uh, so she's tried a variety of things and uh, not a variety, but she's, she's not into tampons. So, uh, but yeah, if you, you know, pads work 
fine too. But she's tried some of these uh, uh, menstrual cups and uh, diva cups and not K cups. You don't want to put a K cup up there. But uh, but anyway, so um, and yeah, they're all, I mean fine. So uh, let's see. That's about that. Let's uh, keep moving out. If there's anything else. Uh, on this slide that I want to discuss. I think that'll do it. Yeah. So instead of an illustration, we get an actual image. And again, we can see uh, the uterus and you see the it's basically the same view. So we can see the, the uh, vertebral column and the coccyx, see the rectum, and then the cervix, vaginal, uh, canal, pubic symphysis, and then there's the urinary bladder. With, again, the uterus sitting right on top of it. Okay, so a couple of items of note and then uh, get you guys going and, and moving on. We've got about a half hour, probably less, maybe 15 minutes. Okay. So again, ovaries like the testes, these are going to be the site of gamete. Uh, production. So we're going to see uh, the appearance of the ovaries again. They, they are uh, kind of nodular, so little kind of hard balls, and they have kind of a puckered, uh, uneven surface after puberty. So, um, so before uh, puberty, they're very smooth. And then as, as you know, puberty comes and they get more active, they have a little bit more of a maybe like a golf ball, kind of an uneven, like dimpled, like puckered surface. Um, again, both each side of the uterus, you have know, left and right uh, ovaries. And ectopic pregnancy occurs when the fetus develops anywhere but the uterus. So they can develop uh, in the fallopian. So fertilization takes place in the fallopian tube. Well, that fertilized egg should be moving down into the uterus. If it's not, and it develops up here, that's an ectopic pregnancy. Some of them even will actually leave the, they could actually uh, develop in the abdominal cavity. They can uh, get fertilized here and go the wrong way and end up out over here and uh, developing. Whew they usually don't live. Um, and in fact, they become, oftentimes they'll become kind of um, like calcified or almost like mummified. Um, they found, there. This, we read about it every once in a while in the news. There was a lady, I think she was in India and she, she uh, was having abdominal issues. She was in her seventies and she thought she was pregnant. She's thinking, I can't be pregnant. I, you know, I'm way past menopause. So anyway, they did an ultrasound. And yeah, they found kind of like a mummified fetus, the inner abdominal cavity that was due to an ectopic pregnancy. So um, anyway, yeah, strange stuff happens, right? It's a human body. So anyway, we see the egg here and then, uh, uh, or the ovary, I should say here. And then uh, again, we get that uh, fallopian tube and uh, the uterus has a couple little stops. We call it the fundic region or the fundus. And of course the cavity. And then the, the uh, lining is called the endometrium. And then just, so that's the epithelium. It's called the endometrium. And then just deep to the uh, endometrium is the muscular, the smooth muscle portion called the myometrium. And then we go uh, even further out and we end up with uh, connecting with some of that peritoneum uh, from, the, uh, from the abdominal wall or the abdominal cavity. We also see, uh, and I have another slide that shows some of the ligaments and some of the ways in which we can kind of keep the uterus in place, kind of keep the uterus suspended a little bit. Okay, so we'll look at that uh, coming up. These little fingers are called fimbriae. It just says kind of as a side note, fimbriae. So when we go a little bit deeper into the ovary itself, look at the kind of the micro scale, just like we did with the testes, we're gonna see the surface covered with uh, what we call germinal epithelium. Those testes were covered with that tunic, right? A little tunica. You see the same thing here, tunica albuginea, okay, covering 
the ovarian cortex. I remember the cortex is the outer kind of region of the uh, of an organ. Okay? The medullary or the medulla is in, in the middle or inside of it. Okay? Um, we're going to see what are called follicles, ovarian follicles. They go that goes with the FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. That's where the oocytes are. Those are the immature uh, egg cells. Okay. And then again, in the medullary aspect, we're going to find blood vessels, nerves, other, uh, you know, connective tissue. So let's look inside. So it's talking about all of this is the connective tissue. This is the medullary aspect of the ovary. This is the cortical aspects, right? The cortex. So this would be the medulla in here. And so the same thing with several several different organs up to this point. So I hope by now cortex and medulla aren't uh, too terribly confusing. All right, so we're going to start down here and kind of work our way clockwise to see what you know, the basics of, a, of an egg. How do we get this uh, egg released from the ovary? So we have, uh, and this is not, this is kind of, this is like our cell uh, composite illustration from way at the beginning of the semester where we have a composite cell, but not all cells certainly don't look like this. Kind of the same thing going on here. This, this illustration is showing all of the steps in one slide instead of this is step one, this is step two, this is step three, this is step four, five, six, you know. So instead of saying this is what's going on, um, not all at once, okay? But we're gonna show you all at once these different structures. All right, I hope that makes sense. So we've got the primary follicles. Okay, so those are the most immature. That's where we begin. There's a granular uh, group of cells in there. You can see some granules. Then we get the secondary follicles. So we're getting a little bigger, a little more food, a little more meat going uh, as we prep this uh, oo site. Okay, so these are the what they call follicular. Pardon me. These are follicular cells, follicle cells. And then we end up with a large, what we call a vesicular follicle. They also call it the graphene molecule or the graphene follicle. Okay. So within this follicle, okay, is going to be the mature oocyte. Okay. And then we're ready for ovulation. So we went from primary follicle, secondary follicle, oocyte. Well, pardon me, big yawn. I need more oxygen to my brain. Whoa. That's why we yawn. It's not, well, sometimes it's because we're tired. I'm not tired, but sometimes it's because I haven't, we haven't breathed for a while. <laughs> you know, too much air going out, not enough oxygen coming in. Ah, there we go. So we, we yawn. It's kind of like a deep breath. It'll yawn to get some of the oxygen going uh, back uh, into the body. So yeah, anyway, yeah, when you're jabbering for an hour and a half straight, nonstop, sometimes you got to stop and take a breath. So, ah. but anyway, ah, ah. so primary, secondary, tertiary or graphene, and then boom, ovulation, we're going to uh, get that egg out of the ovary, and then it's going to travel again right into the fallopian tube. So you can see where it was; it's released, and then it's going to travel up into the fallopian tube. And then we have uh, the, what's called the corpus luteum. And that corpus luteum, you can kind of see what's left of it here. That's, again, some of what they call the antrum. This is like what was kind of feeding the, the, the egg, right? Feeding that maturing egg. Just like a baby, it's gonna, it's half of the baby, right? So just like the sperm cells, right? They were constantly getting fed the whole way through. We see the same thing going on here. We need to feed that egg, get it ready, get it prepped. Okay. Notice there's a little bit of blood that comes from ovulation. So uh, many women during ovulation will spot. So they, they think, oh my gosh, I'm spotting. I just had a period like, you know, 
10 days, like a week ago, 10 days ago, I'm not due up for another couple of weeks. Why am I spotting? Well, it's probably only going to be one wipe or a couple wipes in one day, maybe where you'd get a little bit of spotting. That could mean that you ovulated, that, that, that an egg was released and it's kind of hanging out up there. So, so when ovulation occurs, that egg can, it kind of hangs out up here in the fallopian tube for maybe a couple of days at the most, maybe four even, yeah, maybe up to seven days, probably not, or be between two and four days, they're going to kind of hang out up here waiting for a sperm cell to come, okay? Um, so your, you know, your fertility you know, you're really only fertile for a couple of days out of the whole 28 day cycle. You're really only fertile for like maybe two days, four at the most. However, um, the vaginal uh, canal, as well as the cervix and uterus, they have little uh, kind of crypts or little rooms. And so sometimes sperm cells will be kind of, I guess, held hostage a little bit or captured in the in the uh, female reproductive tract because the ovulation hasn't occurred so uh, if ejaculation occurs and sperm cells are inside of the vaginal canal and inside past the cervix and uterus but ovulation hasn't occurred yet the females can kind of house <laughs> adopt house whatever put up in a room you know the sperm cells uh, for yeah maybe like three days at the most there's some debate it could be longer up to five days maybe so the sperm cell goes in and rents a room or whatever hangs out and waits for ovulation Froop, and then ovulation occurs then the sperm cell leaves so you know you could not be fertile today but be fertile tomorrow and not have sex tomorrow, but have sex today and get pregnant tomorrow. If that, that makes sense. Yeah. So you could, you could feasibly um, have, you know, feasibly have sex, unprotected sex, or maybe trying to have babies, right? And, or maybe not, but, you know, you're like, oh yeah, I'm not going to ovulate for another couple of days. We're good, you know, and whoops, and then they, you know, <laughs> have sex today, and two or three days later, fertilization takes place after the ovulation has taken place. So there's a bigger window, I suppose is what I'm saying, than just like two days to get pregnant. In a month, there's pro probably closer, like, to be on the safe side, like maybe three to five days before ovulation and three to five days after ovulation. So there's like a six to 10 day spot where, you know, you're most, most fertile. Outside of those areas though, you know, you're, you're probably not fertile. You're not gonna get pregnant likely while uh, menstruating, especially at the beginning of, of menstruating. So anyway, just so many ways that uh, uh, pregnancy can occur. Uh, so anyway, uh, corpus luteum, Oh, so a little bit of blood coming from that uh, ovulation. So maybe a little spotting. Uh, corpus luteum, and that's going to kind of degenerate into what they call the corpus albicans. So uh, we'll look at those in a little more detail uh, coming up. So anyway, so that primary follicle, again, primarily we saw uh, granulosal uh, cells or granulosa cells. Yeah. And then uh, eventually that primary follicle is the secondary follicle. It's going to mature into the graphene follicle. And then we're going to see little cumulus cells kind of clumped around that, that uh, oo site. The cumulus, you think of clouds, and, and they do. They actually look like little clouds kind of around uh, that mature egg. So these are cumulus cells. So this is right after ovulation. Okay, so then we 
release the egg or release the ovum at the end of Ooh Genesis and blood is going to fill the antrum and part of that peritoneal cavity. So uh, again, so the antrum, this little area, so this is the blood. So that's basically saying that, yeah, a little bit of blood gets released uh, when we uh, uh, ovulate. Well, when you ovulate, I don't ovulate. When the female ovulates. All right. So what? why do you have ovaries? Again, we need... We need the gametes, so we need the ova. Uh, so that oo genesis process from immature egg to mature egg. Okay, that's part of the ovaries. And then of course, uh, estrogens and progesterone. Okay, the female sex hormones. Progesterone levels and estrogen levels are extremely high during uh, ovulation and yeah. Progesterone means, you know, just before or I'm in favor of gestation, which is pregnancy. So this is a hormone that helps uh, once fertilization takes place, progesterone levels stay high the whole time the baby's in the womb. So nine months, progesterone levels are going to be high. Right before fertilization, progesterone levels are high. So the, and estrogen. And then if fertilization doesn't take place, progesterone and estrogen levels drop. So they think that part of like premenstrual uh, uh, pre syndrome or PMS, some of the depression, some of the sadness, some of the emotional aspects uh, are the morning of the death of an egg that didn't get fertilized. So again, we see progesterone and estrogen levels peak out during right around ovulation. And that's when it's like, yeah, it's a party. Yeah, I feel great. I have, I'm having fun. Everything's awesome. And I didn't get pregnant. Yay, I'm glad I didn't get pregnant. That's awesome. I, I don't want to be pregnant. And then you know, I don't know why I'm so sad or emotional and, you know, it's just PMS. And so part of that is that, that steep drop of hormones. So that's right. I'm hormonal. It's true. That's what, that's, that's exactly what's going on. Hormones are through the roof saying, yay, baby, 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 baby. And then no sperm cell fertilizes the egg. And then the progesterone and estrogen levels plummet. No baby, no baby, no baby. So even if consciously the, the female's like, I'm glad I don't want a baby, there's still PMS aspects of potential, you know, stuff. So that's why big changes in the hormone levels. They completely plummet if uh, fertilization doesn't occur. That's why um, like birth control pills and the patches, they have progesterone levels in them. So what happens, so let's say under normal, so no birth control, under normal conditions, uh, when a female becomes pregnant, that nine months, remember estrogen and progesterone levels are peaked out that whole time baby's in the womb. Well, what doesn't, what does not happen while you're pregnant? You don't get pregnant again, right? You're not, you're not carrying uh, a baby that's in the second trimester and then you get another baby in there and now you got a one in the first trimester and then time goes on now i've got one in the third trimester one in the second trimester and then i get pregnant again that's not how it works right you get one you might have multiple babies at once right you might have twins or triplets or whatever but they still were fertilized and implanted at the same time so you're not gonna add a baby in uh, four months into your pregnancy okay why well, because progesterone and estrogen levels are peaked out, that's what helps with egg and oocyte maturation and, and ovulation. When those levels plummet, that triggers ovulation cycle to start up again. Well, if these never drop, then we're not going to trigger, uh, an, you know, oogenesis doesn't get triggered and we're not going to ovulate. So a lot of birth control pills are actually progesterone synthetic or es estrogen and progesterone levels that are synthesized and um, kind of trick your body into believing it's pregnant. So 
you know, if you start taking the birth control pill at 13 or 14 years old, because your periods are so crazy, um, and that it may be bad endometriosis. <coughs> Pardon me. But anyway, maybe bad endometriosis. I don't know. So anyway, we put uh, teenagers or early 20-somethings, they go on birth control pills, maybe to help with their periods, to help regulate kind of that intense menstrual cramping and flow. So, what, and, and the periods end up being super light. And the, the reason is because the body thinks it's pregnant. It's got progesterone in it. So you have really light periods. They're going to be sometimes non, non-existent uh, because that's the other thing you don't have when you're pregnant is a period, right? There's no, no more egg getting released every month and then not getting fertilized and then a period comes. So you can't get pregnant when you're pregnant. So that's good. And you can't have a period when you're pregnant. Also good. So, uh, but anyway, Uterus again, several uh, ligaments kind of hold it up. We've got the cervical uh, cervix and then the cervical opening there. Okay. Again, a ton of ligaments, broad ligament, two broads, uh, two uh, urosacral, posterior, anterior, two round ligaments. And so you take a P, I mean, there's all these. You got the ovarian, suspensory, uterosacral the broad ligament. So anyway, suspensory, tons of different ligaments kind of suspending all of this stuff. And again, the wall of the uterus, you're going to have the endometrial lining, the myo or muscle. Remember, myo always means muscle. And the perimetrium or the external layer. Blood supply from the uterine, ovarian, and vaginal arteries. So again, the arteries are going to be named for where, where they're at. Um, and why do you have a uterus? Again, that's basically there because we need to house uh, the embryo and then house the fetus. So uh, placenta is going to come from uh, the uterus. We're going to be able to supply nutrients. We're going to be able to take away waste. Uh, and then uh, that muscle layer, that myometrium is going to contract uh, when baby's ready to come out. So uh, the uterus is a perfect, uh, uh, perfectly designed structure for housing uh, uh, a developing fetus and then delivering it once it's ready. Yeah, uterine tubes and fallopian tubes. Again, you've, we've got the, uh, the uh, ampulla, the infundibulum, and the isthmus. Um, I don't think it's necessary that you know the specifics of, um, of the uterine tube levels. So the infundibulum, ampulla, and then the isthmus going from ovary out. Okay, so the uterine tube, again, it's we've got the lumen and uh, kind of a mucosal uh, layer. We see uh, they look like uh, columnar cells. Okay, and they're going to be secreting. There's some mucosal cells. You can see these kind of white blobs, some mucosal cells in there as well. Okay, so this is the epithelial lining. And then you can kind of see the basement membrane, and then uh, there's a little bit of connective tissue right in here. A little bit of connective tissue, a little tiny bit. And then we get into the smooth muscle layer, and then the outer layer, that serosa layer, which again will be epithelium and connective. So it'll be connective, then epithelium. Okay, so epithelium, connective, muscle, connective, epithelium. And that's that. We've seen it throughout uh, the last probably four uh, or five weeks. Here's the inside of of, of the uh, uh, of a uterine tube or fallopian tube. You see a sperm cell has made it in, kind of traveling through. As you see these little kind of cilia and bumps. Okay. 
and then the vaginal uh, canal again that's the uh, the tubular organ uh, lies again between uh, uh, the rectum and the urethra and the bladder we see the uh, uh, the egg kind of the the deep part of the vaginal canal leads you to the cervix and the cervical opening into uh, the uterus. Okay. A collapsible tube, it can distend quite a bit. Uh, anterior or the front wall is shorter than the posterior wall. Okay. So there's a little kind of anterior wall that's short and then past that things open up into more of a, of a larger uh, posterior wall. And then the hymen is a small mucous membrane that forms a border around the vaginal opening or the vaginal uh, orifice. And again, it's going to be the lower portion of the birth canal. Okay. And so there's lubrication and stimulation of the penis during intercourse. There's going to be, um, there's also going to be some of the, the lubricant is going to have um, some potentially there's there's arousal fluid which is going to be extremely uh, slick and viscous but then there's also fertilization for like fertility fluid which is going to be viscous but it's also going to be sticky so if there's if the fertility or if the arousal fluid is sticky that's an indicator that the, uh, we're probably dealing with some ovulation areas Sticky always means sugar. So if the sperm cells enter into the vaginal canal and there's, there's a buffet there, there's more sugar, then it's going to enable them to continue going. So um, arousal fluid is just for that. It's just it's just for arousal purposes. It's for, for reducing some of the friction, provides some lubrication uh, between the skin and skin contact. Okay. Whereas lubrication fluid with ar ar arousal fluid for lubrication, coupled with some stickum or sticky aspects, again that means there's sugar involved. That means that we're the the female is potentially ovulating. So keep that in mind as well. And again, that's the transportation route out as well, not just for the baby, but for the menstrual uh, aspects. And then the external aspect of the female reproductive system, we call the vulva. Lost my captions at some point. Oops. Okay, so this is what they call the vulva. And again, there's going to be the, the larger labia and then the smaller labia, what they call a vestibule. It's like, again, kind of an entryway to a building is also known as a vestibule. And then there's kind of like a, what they call the foreskin. We see the same thing with the penis. There's like a foreskin or a hood that covers the clitoris. And then again, just beneath or just inferior to that, we would find uh, the pee hole, right? The urinary uh, meatus or the external urethral orifice, they also call it. And then you have that hymen, uh, kind of that uh, tissue along the edge of the vaginal uh, opening or the vaginal orifice. Okay, and then we have a couple of bulbs here. A, a clitoral bulb is uh, basically it's a um, it's going to provide some of the lubricant okay, uh, on the external um, aspects of the vulva. Okay. And then the frenulum at the bottom and then we've got kind of like a commissure or like a kind of like a groove or a fold here this is going to go down to the toward the the anus and this is oftentimes where what we call an episiotomy may have to be performed uh, during childbirth so during a natural birth uh, we want to prevent tearing here. So sometimes the physician uh, will make a little, or the, you know, the, the, the OB uh, will make a little incision right in here to allow for a little more stretching uh, for the baby to be born. And then they may have to put a couple little sutures there. That's called an, an episiotomy. So, um, 
That's just about it. Uh, we go through the reproductive cycle next semester a little bit when we get into fertility and, and uh, heredity and genetics. Um, but I want to mention uh, a couple of things. We have the what, what you know is the menstrual cycle into four phases called menses, uh, postmenstrual, or the pre-ovulatory pre phase. So menses is actually going to be you shedding your lining. This is having your period. Uh, menstruating. So after you menstruate, uh, that's what they call the pre-ovulatory post-menstrual phase. And then you're going to ovulate. And then uh, after the ovulation uh, phase, you have the pre-menstrual or luteal phase. Again, that's if if fertilization did not take place. And that, that corpus luteum, that luteal phase is, is going to have to do with that lining that's going to start kind of developing and, and preparing for fertilization. And if fertilization didn't take place, then we see, uh, again, the progesterone and estrogen levels drop. Uh, we see then some of the cramping going on that's going to start the process of removing that uterine lining. Okay, and then we go back then to the menstrual phase. Okay, so again, estrogen levels hit the peak, causes and triggers ovulation. Okay, and again, these are all coming from the, the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary. So we get FSH again and LH. So uh, with, uh, um, with FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, uh, that's where we're going to see uh, estrogen secretion. So stimulates primary follicles. So the primary follicles start getting going, and then we're going to get that estrogen uh, secretion taking place. Now, at the same time, LH is being uh, released from the anterior pituitary, kind of uh, progressing that uh, primary follicle into the secondary follicle into the graphene follicle. So we see then that leading to then ovulation. So then again, rupturing of the ovary, expelling an ovum or an egg, and then luteinization causing that corpus luteum from the ruptured follicle. Um, and again, this is where progesterone and estrogen are going to come from, that corpus luteum. Okay, so progesterone and estrogen secretion by the corpus luteum. Uh, again, the, if, if fertilization takes place, we're going to see progesterone and estrogen levels skyrocket. Okay, and if, if, if we didn't get fertilization, then we see progesterone, progesterone and estrogen levels plummet. And that's what we call the, lute, uh, the luteinizing stage or the premenstrual stage. Okay. So LH, uh, pre-ovulatory follicles. So again, get, getting the, the stage one or step one and step two, uh, primary follicles, secondary follicles going. And then we're going to kind of break down some of that tissue. So the when the egg ruptures, that it's not having to rupture through uh, super thick walls. And then it, what it does, it prompts the formation of that corpus luteum, which again is kind of your temporary endocrine gland for progesterone and estrogen release. Okay, so again, progesterone, uh, level of progesterone rises after a luteinizing hormone surge. So LH comes in and causes then progesterone to go up. So uh, again, the idea is, is that a pregnancy is going to occur. Well, it, most of the time it doesn't, right? Well, the body doesn't know that. It can happen any time. So every single cycle, every 28-day cycle, is going to be should be somewhat similar, but uh, in in what's going on, but within with that twenty eight day cycle, the idea is is that an egg is going to get released, the egg is going to get fertilized. We're going to provide that fertilized egg with a home, and that means hormone levels are going to be up here. That's what we're planning on, but unfortunately, well, I don't know, unfortunately, but I guess 
or whatever, you know, most of the time it doesn't happen, right? So then what you have is that drop in all those hormone levels and then the release of the endometrial lining and corpus luteum is no longer uh, necessary because we don't need progesterone and estrogen pumping. Um, because again, that's going to keep that, that's going to prevent a new follicle or a new egg from being released, those levels of progesterone and estrogen. So that corpus luteum acts as an endocrine, temporary endocrine gland uh, that is either going to be temporary for just a day or two uh, or th three days until we didn't get pregnant, then we don't need the corpus luteum, we get rid of it. If we do get pregnant, we have that extra estrogen and progesterone uh, produ production site. And, and what that does, it tells the ovary as well, do not release another egg because the corpus luteum is present in the ovary producing estrogen and progesterone. So that's kind of the trigger to help to keep you from producing another egg. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do use increasing estrogen levels post-menstrual phase. So uh, again, so we're done menstruating. Now we're starting to, to get toward ovulation. So uh, post-menstrual is called pre-ovulation uh, as well. Yeah. Increased water content, uh, uh, growth of, and again, again, just prepping, preparing for the possibility of an, of an egg being released and then subsequently getting fertilized. Okay. So again, so then ovulation occurs and then the uterus and progesterone levels, estrogen levels are high. The endometrial gland is preparing the endometrium for that implantation, uh, increasing, you know, we're getting more bloated, water content is, is you know, uh, decreasing contractions, and then boom, nothing happens. There is nothing to implant, no fertilization took place. Then we're going to start seeing estrogen progesterone levels drop, corpus luteum is done being inside of the ovary, and then now we're going to start shedding that lining. Okay. Gonadotropins, again, these are FSH, LH, okay. So anyway, this is physiology. We do that. I didn't, well, I probably said too much already. So, but anyway, ovarian cycle, again, produce uh, an ovum at regular intervals, secondary function, uh, regulating the endometrial cycle with progesterone and estrogen. So the corpus luteum in essence regulates the, the, the uh, presence or not presence of the endometrial lining. Yeah. Again, that endometrial cycles making the uterus suitable for implantation. So again, fertile only a few days really out of each month. Okay. But like I said, there's a, the chance that the, that the, the female can can keep some of those sperm cells in crypts. So we've talked about fertility uh, plenty. Um, lastly, uh, menstrual flow at puberty uh, varies, of course, race, nutrition, health, heredity, there's a lot of factors. Some people start a period at 10, some people start at 15, right? It's a big range. Occurs for roughly 30 years, right? So right around your 40s, mid to late 40s, it's going to end and estrogen levels decrease. And uh, so, yeah. So again, estrogens, so right about 12, 13, estrogen levels peaking out till right around 50. And then we see gonadotropins, right? they kind of take over. Uh, you see that overlap between 40 and 50. Okay. So estrogens go down, gonadotropins. So FSH, LH, those are gonadotropins. Okay. So they still, they're still around. Okay. 
they do other things too than just help with the release of an egg. So we'll talk about these again more next semester when we get into a little bit of uh, uh, more with endocrine system, uh, hormone regulation, and certainly uh, fertilization, uh, uh, genetics, heredity, all that good stuff. So estrogen and progesterones, again, control uh, breast development. Okay, breast size determined by the amount of fat around the glandular tissue. So less fat, probably uh, less uh, lesser in size. More fat, uh, more fat uh, or more breast tissue. Size has nothing to do with milk production, size of the breast. So uh, again, the, the glandular aspects, uh, all of these uh, uh, mammary glands and, and all of the ducts lead out to the nipple. And again, this is all of the fatty tissue around uh, is what leads to uh, breast tissue uh, being larger in some and smaller in others. And a lot of that's genetic uh, based and heredity as well. Yeah, so you can see all these little uh, alveoli, these little kind of grapes that have milk uh, being produced. And then we have a, a little tiny duct into a ductule, we call it, into a duct, and then out to uh, the nipple pores. Yeah. So you can see the milk production heading into the little ductule. Okay, and then down through the, the uh, lactiferous ducts. You can see the, the baby uh, can pull the nipple in pretty far. Okay, and you can see multiple, um, multiple pores in the nipple providing milk. Okay. Let's see. Da, 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 da. So yeah, prolactin and oxytocin. Those are your two chemicals for, for lactation and breast milk. Now, um, so suckling is going to stimulate prolactin production, which is going to stimulate uh, the secretion of milk uh, from the breast alveoli into those ducts. Okay, so this is anterior pituitary, prolactin. I'm in favor of milk, secreting the milk, whereas oxytocin comes from the posterior pituitary. We usually think of oxytocin as relating to uterine contractions during childbirth, um, but we also see oxytocin playing a role in helping the ejection of milk. So the breast alveoli eject the milk into the ducts to where the infant can remove it. So, uh, so again, two separate hormones. The prolactin helps to just secrete the milk, whereas uh, oxytocin is, remember, it's, oxytocin plays a role of like a smooth muscle um, uh, contractor. So if I, it, it, oxytocin helps to eject the baby from the womb. It also helps to eject milk from the breasts. So secreting milk is just getting the milk into the ducts, actually ejecting the milk does require oxytocin. So some women have issues with breastfeeding. Uh, they may have prolactin levels may be okay, but oxytocin levels are, are messed up. And it could be because they received a bunch of pitocin uh, during the delivery of the baby. So it, it kind of altered uh, potentially the, uh, the natural oxytocin from, from being available for ejecting that milk. So baby can suck and suck and suck and you're not getting very much milk out because of the lack of oxytocin, which actually enables the, the ejection of the milk from the nipple. Okay. And again, why do we need lactation? We need uh, nutrients, certainly. Uh, we, immune system is big for uh, the baby when we breastfeed. And then, of course, it helps with emotional bonding between the mother and the child. So that's really all I had uh, today. I know uh, you probably knew uh, quite a bit of that. Hopefully, I was able to provide you with a few uh, new bits of information that you can take with you both in your personal lives and certainly your professional lives. So um, you guys, uh, um, 
Let's see. Where are we at on time? I'll tell you what. Yeah, we're pretty much done. In fact, I think we, we've gone over time. So I'm going to uh, end the video for today. Now, I do want to go through Unit 9. I'll make a separate video uh, for that, uh, the Unit 9 portfolio. So I'll go through that, and uh, I, I may do that at the, be the very... Um, I don't know. I'll do it at some point. I may put it at the uh, the beginning of of the this evening's so so tonight's session. Um, if you watch the video for from tonight, uh, the very beginning, I'll go through that so you can see uh, some of what I'm looking for for definitions and terms for Unit Nine, and you can also see some of the identification stuff uh, as well. So anyhow, that's, that's it. And you guys have a great weekend. Uh, and again, next week, we don't have class. I said it's optional, but you know, again, I'll, I'll be available, but uh, I don't have anything new for you guys. And I, I'd really like you to, to, to just take the time over the next eight or 10 days and and just get everything knocked out that you can. I'm going to be doing the same on my end, getting the grades put in and uh, your Padlet grades and all your, your portfolios and so anyway keep keep trucking and keep moving along and if you guys have questions of course please email me if you need more time let me know um you'd know by the end of next week if you're you know where you are so um so anyway uh, i've enjoyed all of our time together it's gone extremely fast and i i hope that uh, all of you have registered for spring semester and are planning on uh, taking advanced uh, uh at some you know hopefully next semester because you do this stuff's fresh in your mind so you know make sure you've registered and and uh if i don't see you before have have happy holidays and and again, stay safe, stay smart, and, and don't work too hard. Get plenty of rest and, and enjoy the time off that you have uh, with your family and, uh, uh, and, and, and your friends. So, um, so anyhow, stay warm and, and stay safe and stay healthy. Yep, you're welcome, Eduardo. Yep. See you next semester, Brittany. Have fun. Yep. Let me know if you need anything. Okay. Excellent.